Welcome to Animal Rights, the Abolitionist Approach Commentary. I'm Gary Franciong. This is our ninth No Frills, No Bells, No Whistles podcast concerning the abolition as opposed to the regulation of animal exploitation, ethical veganism as the moral baseline of the animal rights movement, creative nonviolent vegan education as the primary form of animal advocacy, and the general importance of the principle of nonviolence in all of our advocacy efforts. In this uh, commentary, I would like to more or less continue the discussion that uh, I started in our last commentary concerning the principles of the abolitionist position. One of those uh, principles is that there is really no difference between animal rights and human rights in that all forms of exploitation uh, share certain things in common and are related to each other and that uh, the abolitionist approach takes the position that just as animal exploitation is wrong so is human exploitation and that we should not use racism, sexism, heterosexism, ageism or any other form of discrimination in our efforts on behalf of non-human animals. In this commentary, I want to focus particularly on sexism because since the late 80s, early 90s, the movement, uh, largely as a result of PETA's campaigns, has been dominated by sexism and the use of sexism supposedly to promote animal advocacy. Uh, and and I think that that's, that's a very, very bad idea for a number of different reasons, which I'll get to in a second. But let me say as a general matter, uh, the position that the animal rights movement has no position about other forms of discrimination, that it's a standalone position, is simply wrong. The position that speciesism is wrong because it is like racism, sexism, heterosexism, and other forms of discrimination logically implies that those other forms of discrimination are wrong. And therefore, we do have a position. Those of us who take morality seriously do have a position on these other forms of discrimination uh, about racism, sexism, heterosexism, and, and what have you. Um, so the notion that, that the animal rights movement doesn't have a position on this is just, in my judgment, absurd. I remember in the early 90s, uh, I was invited to a meeting of uh, what was uh, called the Summit for the Animals. I do not know if that still exists, if that institution still exists, but every year the leaders of the um, large animal welfare corporations used to get together to discuss uh, issues, the common issues. And, um, and they would often invite uh, people to come in to talk about various topics. And I was invited uh, one year to the summit for the animals to discuss with uh, with folks the relationship between human rights and animal rights, particularly uh, the the concern that I had then and that I have now about the use of sexism supposedly to promote the animal rights agenda, and I I discussed this issue uh, at length with uh, with the people at that meeting and. A number of them just took the position that, well, you know, this is a standalone movement and this is a standalone issue. And, you know, we don't, as in the animal rights movement, we don't take a position on on uh, on racism or sexism or heterosexism or anything else. I mean, the, the, the focus, my focus in that, in, that, uh, in that presentation was primarily about sexism. But I was talking about the relationship between human rights and animal rights as a general matter. And I, I, I continue to be uh, astonished that those people who promote animal rights think that, uh, the animal issue is a standalone issue and is not related to other forms of discrimination or violence involving, uh, and by the way, discrimination is a form of violence, uh, other forms of violence involving uh, human animals. And um, now I understand what, that, that, that these large organizations don't like to, t to take a position or often don't like to take a position on these other forms of discrimination because that may affect uh, contributions uh, because there is controversy about these issues and uh, there are some people who who uh, have very uh, conservative or reactionary attitudes about these uh, these forms of violence or discrimination and uh, they might not contribute uh, if uh, if organizations take positions on human rights issues uh, or, or even acknowledge the relationship between human rights and animal rights, or even refuse to to use these other forms of discrimination in 
uh, their animal advocacy campaigns. I understand that concern, that there's a money concern here, but as far as the, uh, the ideas are concerned, as far as the, the logic of the position is concerned, to say that speciesism is, is wrong because it is like racism, sexism, heterosexism, and other forms of discrimination, which I hear animal advocates say all the time. I hear animal advocates say, oh yes, speciesism is bad, it's like racism, it's like sexism. Well, that logically implies that we have a position on racism and sexism and other forms of discrimination, i.e. that those forms of discrimination are morally unacceptable. So let me focus a little bit in particular about sexism because that is the primary form of discrimination which is used supposedly to promote, and I say supposedly because I don't think that it works very well, but in any event, even if it did, it would be problematic. But sexism is the primary form of discrimination which is supposedly used to promote the animal rights agenda. Uh, let me say this. I think sexism is inherently wrong. I think that, um, that uh, uh, our patriarchal society treats women as second-class citizens, uh, marginalizes them. They are not uh, compensated on an equal basis for their labor efforts in the same way that men are. Um, and so I, I, think that there, I think that sexism is inherently wrong. Uh, but I also think that, as a practical matter, as long as we continue to commodify women, we're going to continue to commodify animals. So the, the bottom line is, uh, as long as we are tolerating and promoting sexism, uh, we're going to be dealing with speciesism. They are very, very closely relate, related, and it's simply unrealistic to believe that we are going to achieve justice for non-human animals while denying justice to women or other humans, but, 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 while deny, but while promoting a sexist agenda, while tolerating patriarchy, the idea that we're going to do something really significant for animals is, is a fantasy. As long as we are continuing to commodify women, we're going to commodify animals. As long as we're treating women like pieces of meat, we are going to continue to treat animals like pieces of meat. It is that simple. It simply does not work to um, uh, uh, you know, use sexism to, to promote the animal rights agenda. Uh, these forms of discrimination are very closely related. Uh, let's think about pornography for a second. What is pornography? Pornography is, involves the consumption of, a, of another human as body parts. I mean, when we consume pornography, what goes on in the consumption of pornography? Well, people, people look at women, and again, I'm aware that there, are, there is pornography involving men, and I'll discuss that in a second. I don't think it's the same sort of thing. But uh, people will look at uh, movies or books or whatever they look at, uh, you know, films or, or, or magazines or whatever, and they'll consume body parts. The, the, the person is no longer there. There is no longer a, a, a woman there. There's no longer a person there. There are simply body parts that are consumed. The personhood of, of the woman is simply not present. Simply, it's denied and is not present. Um, instead, the woman is viewed as whatever body parts we fetishize. That's all. That's what she's become. Uh, similarly, we go to the store, we buy chicken in styrofoam trays covered by cellophane. The, the non-human person is no longer there. It's a series of body parts that we're consuming. So the personhood is gone. It's the same thing with any, any other form of, of, of flesh or dairy product. The personhood, the non-human personhood, uh, the non-human person is no longer there. The non-human personhood is denied. And we are consuming body parts or, 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 you know, milk or cheese or whatever product that we're consuming. Um, but the non-human person is no longer there. Just as with pornography, the non-human person is no longer there. This is absolutely clear. It doesn't really require any complicated philosophical analysis to see this. I mean, I've never known uh, I mean, I, it, if over over the years I had five cents for every time a man, another man said to me, oh, I would be very upset if my wife or my mother or my lover or my sister were involved in pornography or uh, working in a uh, strip club or something like that. Um, it, most people, uh, as a matter of fact, every person I've ever spoken to about this topic says, oh yes, I'd really object to my mother, sister, lover, whatever, working in such a place or being involved in the, in the porn industry. But yet, the women who are involved in the porn industry, every single one of them is someone's daughter, is someone's sister, is someone's, you know, mother, is someone's lover, is someone's wife. So, I mean, it, it, 
it's interesting how, again, a form of moral schizophrenia and confusion. It's interesting how, on, on one hand, we recognize there's something terribly wrong with the commodification of women that goes on in pornography. But, um, uh, but we also, uh, at, at, the, at the same time, think it's fine to consume. Just as, in the case of, you know, just, just, as, just as with non-human animals, we recognize there's something terribly wrong with our consuming non-human animals, but most of us continue to do it anyway, which is why we need some clear thinking on the topic and why we need to stop uh, uh, marginalizing these issues and marginalizing these discussions and failing to have these discussions, which is basically what goes on in, in, in the movement. The level of of discussion and of, uh, of, of debate about these topics is virtually non-existent. Now, there is pornography that involves men, but it's different. Why is it different? Because we live in a patriarchal society. We live in a society in which men and male values are are given greater weight and greater and you know given greater weight uh, and 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 in which women are marginalized women do not have the economic resources that men have in the society they're treated in different ways that they're marginalized in different ways uh, there is an enormous amount of discrimination that goes on uh, against women in the workplace and and indeed in every other every other context in our society so although I'm not saying that pornography involving men is a good idea. I mean, I don't think we should commodify each other in any way. I do think that it has a much more insidious effect and a much more harmful effect where women are concerned as opposed to where men are concerned. Why? Because we live in a patriarchal society in which women are commodified and, and pornography and other forms of sexism uh, uh, have a much more detrimental impact on women because, because those forms of, or those activities simply facilitate and promote sexism, the sexism that exists, the, the uneven uh, uh, balances that, you know, that, the, of, 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 for want of a better word, power that exists in the society. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, we can, again, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to be misunderstood as promoting pornography involving men. Uh, I don't want to say, oh, well, let's start having, I'd rather go naked than wear fur, demonstra than wear fur demonstrations involving men only. Um, I think that would be a, a mistake as well. But I think it would be different. And, and uh, you know, so anyway, um, I think that we, we really should uh, take a step back and look at these sexist campaigns. Um, they're, they're damaging, in my judgment, they're damaging the movement incredibly. They're making people dismiss the movement. Uh, I mean, think about it for a second. Uh, would Martin Luther King have said, I'd rather go naked than sit in the back of the bus? The answer is, of course not. Uh, these these campaigns having women sitting in cages or having you know having having uh, uh, women go naked uh, at the at the bull runs in Spain or having people uh, it's just it's silly. I mean, think about it for a second. It's silly. It it yes, it gets it gets some media attention. Uh, it gets some media attention uh, simply because the you know we have twenty four hour news cycles. We have you know a, a, a zillion different uh, news uh, uh, sources, and these people need to get something to keep themselves going. So they'll basically report on just about anything. So yes, there'll be some media attention. But is it changing anything? I mean, I remember having a discussion with the folks at PETA about the I'd rather go naked than refer campaign. And, and, and that, that discussion occurred either in the very, you know, in the late 80s or very early 90s. And, and um, I remember objecting to the campaign, not only because I thought it was inherently wrong, but because I didn't think it would do anything, that it wasn't going to stop people from wearing fur. And the proof is in the vegan pudding people. I mean, you know, it, in 2009, the fur industry is bigger and stronger than it's ever been. And I don't really see uh, in any way that the, the um, I'd rather go naked than wear fur campaign has done anything except generate media attention for the people who promote it. But I don't see that it's having any effect uh, uh, for, for uh, you know, for animals. Indeed, I think what it's done is it's given uh, many intelligent people and many progressive people and many thoughtful people a very good excuse, yet another very good excuse, to dismiss the important issue involved in uh, the animal rights, uh, the animal rights matter. There are some people who say that, well, there's nothing wrong with these campaigns or these activities because women voluntarily choose to engage in them. And the answer to that is, well, 
Yeah, sure. I'm, and I'm not saying, please don't get me wrong, I am not saying that women ought to be prohibited legally from uh, participating in uh, porn industries or in, uh, in, in their self-commodification. Uh, I have, I, I do not think that that's the, I don't think censorship is the answer and I'm not interested in legal mechanisms to stop women from doing that sort of thing or making that sort of choice if that's what they wish to do. But I think we have to understand something. In a patriarchal society, uh, again, it doesn't require, um, you, you know, genius intelligence to sort of understand that in a patriarchal society, women's choices are constrained by that patriarchy to the extent that there is pervasive discrimination in the society, to the extent that there's commodification of women in the society, the choices that women make are necessarily constrained by that, by that, that, those, those institutions, those discriminatory institutions. So, you know, are women choosing? Yes, they are choosing, but within a context in which their commodification is a primary way of promoting and facilitating their discrimination. So, you know, I mean, I, I have no doubt that women are choosing to participate in this. Uh, but I also think that we've got to be mindful of the fact that the choices that they're making are occurring within a, a, a patriarchal society in which there is pervasive discrimination against women. Are women empowering themselves in this way? I, I don't, I mean, I, that's another thing I hear, that women empower themselves by choosing to do this sort of thing. I, I find that bewildering. I, I have to be very honest with you. I find that bewildering that people uh, maintain, that some people maintain that it is possible for a woman to empower herself by, by self-commodifying. Uh, that to me uh, is no different from saying that um, uh, a slave could empower herself um, and become a, a, a house Negro by being compliant and subservient to uh, the people who controlled the movement of field Negroes to house Negroes, i.e. there were slaves that worked in the fields, they called them uh, field Negroes, and then there were slaves who worked in the house, they were, they were house Negroes. Now, obviously it was better to uh, be a house Negro because your life was better. It was uh, you know, you were beaten less, you were treated better, uh, and uh, so it was in your interest to do that. Now, uh, did, did some people choose to uh, further degrade and commodify themselves in order to become house Negroes? The answer is yes, of course they did. Um, and was that a voluntary choice? Well, yes, it was, but it was a choice that was made in the context of slavery. Was it an empowering choice? Well, it was, a, it was, it, it was beneficial to them in certain respects. Was it empowering? I don't know that I would call a, a decision to self-commodify. I don't know that I would call that a, a decision. As a matter of fact, I would not call that a decision to empower. I, I, I would find it odd to call that a decision to empower. So, you know, to the extent that, uh, that, that some people maintain that, you know, these are voluntary decisions, I have no doubt that they're voluntary decisions, but they're voluntary decisions within a particular context. And are they empowering decisions? I don't think so at all. As a matter of fact, I find it bizarre that that people maintain that uh, it is somehow how empowering for women to participate in the porn industry or work in a strip joint. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I just, I, that bewilders me, absolutely bewilders me. Again, I just want to, to focus us on the fact that sexism is inherently wrong. The commodification of women is inherently wrong. Discrimination against women on the basis of sex is wrong. Harassment of women is wrong. Uh, this is yet another reason why, by the way, I'm not a big fan of the anti-fur campaign because it has been uh, very mischievous over the years and it has provided many opportunities for sexist and misogynistic behavior. But I think that sexism and misogyny are inherently wrong. I also think as a practical matter, again, there's a theoretical issue here and there's a practical issue here. And the theoretical issue is it's wrong. It's morally wrong. It can't be justified. The practical reason is it doesn't work. This is like animal welfare. Animal welfare is wrong because if it's wrong to use animals, okay, if it's morally wrong to use animals, we ought not to be promoting the regulated use of animals. We ought to be promoting the abolition of animal exploitation. So there's a theoretical issue, but also there's a practical question. And that is, does animal welfare work? My answer is no, absolutely not. If anything, it makes matters worse because it encourages people to continue to consume animals. Okay. Um, but uh, and the, sa the same sort of analysis, the, sort of, the, the same sort of two-pronged analysis applies here in the context of sexism. Sexism is inherently wrong, but it is also 
impractical in that it doesn't work. It's not going to, by promoting sexism, by having naked, by having uh, uh, women sitting in cages with, you know, lettuce leaves or, 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 or having uh, police departments, uh, you know, asking police departments to uh, paint, um, you know, PETA actually recently offered a, um, a police department, as I recall, in California, some money because they were having financial problems. If they would put Go Vegan with a, um, with a, with a, a woman uh, naked except for some lettuce leaves on her, on the, if they painted that on the side of the police cars. Now, obviously, PETA knows that the police department isn't going to do that. But I mean, what's, the point of, what's the point of promoting uh, uh, or, or, or asking that a woman be put naked on the side of the police car? Uh, what's the point of that? Does anybody really think that that's going to do anything? Does anybody really believe that that's going to that that's going to enlighten anybody about animal exploitation? Does anybody really believe that's going to shift the paradigm? Does anybody really believe that that is going to move animals away from the status of being property and move them toward the status of personhood? Does anybody really believe that? Or is this just, you know, entertainment? And I would suggest that when we are killing 56 billion animals every year for food, not counting fish and other aquatic animals. 56 billion. And I would guess the number of fish is probably close to that as well, if, not, if, doesn't, ex if it doesn't exceed it. I mean, I would, I would imagine that the number of fish is, is probably as much as that, if not more. So we're talking about 100 billion animals a year for food. And the solution to that is having women sitting in cages naked or painting women with lettuce leaves on the side of police cars. Does anybody really believe that's going to do anything other than serve as entertainment for a certain segment of the movement that apparently needs constant entertainment. This is a social movement. This is an important issue. This is the issue, in many ways, the issue of our time. This is the issue of massive violence against the most vulnerable among us. This is an issue that requires serious thinking, serious analysis. We're not going to get anywhere as long as the answer to this problem or the, or, the, or the way in which we try to move the discourse is in the direction of, I'd rather go naked than wear fur, that's never, ever, ever going to work. It's morally wrong, and it's never going to work. So in conclusion, I would say that the relationship between human rights and animal rights is clear. We object to discrimination on the basis of species. Why do we object to that? Because like other forms of discrimination which use an irrelevant criterion to exclude sentient beings from the moral community, racism uses race, an irrelevant criterion, to exclude people from the moral community. Sexism uses gender as a, a criterion for excluding people from the moral community. As a matter of fact, gender is itself a social construction. So sexism uses a, an arbitrary social construction to keep women out, out of the moral community or as not as full members of the moral community, I guess is a better way to say that. All forms of discrimination use an irrelevant criterion to exclude people from full membership in the moral community. To say that speciesism is wrong because it is like those forms of discrimination is logically to take the position that those other forms of discrimination are wrong. Which is why the abolitionist approach to animal rights makes very clear that there is a relationship between human rights and animal rights. And that we should not be using discrimination, any form of discrimination, of human discrimination. We should never, ever, ever use racism, sexism, heterosexism, ageism, whatever. We should never use another form of discrimination supposedly to promote animal rights. It's morally wrong and it's never going to work. What we need to do is sensitize people to the problems of discrimination. And I'm not saying that animal organizations should put all of their resources, or any of their resources really, into, into campaigns against other forms of discrimination. I do think that animal organizations ought to take the position that, those other form, that, that all discrimination against humans is unacceptable, and I certainly think that animal organizations ought not to use these other forms of discrimination in order to promote, supposedly to promote, animal rights. You know, for some years now, I have with Anna Charlton been teaching a course uh, precisely on this topic, human rights and animal rights, at Rutgers University. And um, 
We are currently teaching the course, and we have 60 absolutely marvelous students uh, in our class, and um, and they really are. They're terrific, and uh, I mean, their 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 level of preparation of 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 thinking about these issues are the class discussions we have i wish i could invite you all to come and sit in on some of those classes because they are just absolutely terrific and the students really take the material seriously and we have some very very interesting uh discussions in that class but uh it's clear that there there is a relationship between violations of human rights and violations of animal rights, that there is very a very clear connection between violence against humans and violence against non-humans. These things are all connected people. And so that's the thought for this week. And, and you know, to summarize it all, let me just repeat again. Would Martin Luther King have said, I'd rather go naked than sit in the back of the bus? And the answer is no. No, because that would have cheapened his 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 movement. That would have given people yet another excuse to dismiss the important issues of civil rights, the vital issues of civil rights, it would have given people yet another reason to dismiss those important issues. So I ask you, why are we doing that in the animal context? Why are we, why are we not giving animals and the animal issue the same level of dignity? All right, well, that's it for the ninth Animal Rights, the Abolitionist Approach Commentary. Thank you very much for listening. If you're not vegan, go vegan. It's incredibly easy. It's better for your health, the health of the planet, and most importantly, it's the morally right thing to do. And when I say vegan, I mean we should not use, eat, or wear any animal products. We ought to support the abolition of animal exploitation, and we ought to use creative, nonviolent vegan education as our primary form of animal advocacy. Visit us at www.abolitionistapproach.com or follow me on Twitter. Thanks very much. See you next time.